I'm James Fratsky, and this is Leaders. There's this quote I really love by Sir Isaac Newton. It goes like this. If I've seen further than others, it's by standing upon the shoulders of giants. So Leaders is an opportunity for you and I to stand on the shoulders of giants and learn from their journey. On each episode, I'll interview a proven leader, CEO, entrepreneur, or founder, and unpack their story of success. On this episode, Don DeConstanzo. He is the founder and CEO of Pedego Electric Bikes. And I had the privilege of visiting Pedego HQ after this interview. Don walked me around showing me all the behind the scenes secrets that makes his brand so successful. They have over 100 stores nationwide and do about $20 million in revenue. And after talking to Don, I wanted to buy one of his electric bikes based on his personality alone. He's one of those entrepreneurs who tries to scratch his own itch and then turns them into successful businesses. He wants to be the Apple or Starbucks of electric bikes. And I'll let Don tell you more about it. Here's my interview with Pedago CEO, Don DeConstanzo. Don, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you for asking. In other interviews, I've seen you say that you ask people when you meet them for the first time, are you looking for fun or are you looking for trouble? So I will ask you in this interview, are you looking for fun or are you looking for trouble? I'm absolutely looking for fun. We don't do trouble. We ran out of trouble a long time ago. At my age, I've decided that it's much better to experience fun than it is to look for trouble. So you spent 30 years in the automotive industry. You founded Pedigo in your 50s. So you started the company after 50. Last year, uh, Pedigo did $20 million in revenue. How did you first get started? You know, I've heard the story. You used to live on top of a hill. You'd ride your bike down. It was a lot harder to, to ride it back up. Tell us a little bit about that story. Well, you know, when I was a kid, I rode a bike all the time, and I never worried about hills. And if I had a hill, I just, you know, worked my way up it, even if I had to get off and walk it. But as I got older, I lived at the top of a hill. And I loved to ride my bike down to the beach, but I hated to ride back up the hill. So consequently, my bike sat in the garage and I never rode them because I went into the garage and I looked at the bike. I looked at the car and I decided, you know what, I don't want to ride back up that hill. So I'd jump in my car and down to the beach I would go. But then I discovered an electric bike and I thought, well, that's a really good idea. So I bought one online. They shipped it to my house. It was a terrible piece of junk. It took me three months to get it operating. The company I bought it from was terrible, but I was determined. And I finally got it to operate. I finally got it to take out for a ride. And, oh, my God, it got me up the hill. And that's when I had the aha moment and said, oh, my God, if somebody would do this right, this could be a real bell ringer. And that's how Pedego began. But I didn't start by, uh, by just uh, opening Pedego. I started by opening a retail store in Newport Beach, California, next to the Crab Cooker restaurant. And I opened up the store selling electric cars, electric bikes, electric skateboards, anything I could find electric, and electric golf carts. And I discovered very quickly in the one year that I owned the store that the big hot button was the electric bike. And uh, after a year of doing that, I decided to sell the store and concentrate my efforts in building the best brand of electric bikes that I could. I love that story, Don, because it's the classic entrepreneurial, I have an itch, so I'm going to scratch it. But before you started Pedigo, you actually spent 30 years in the corporate world. If you could do it over again, would you have kind of skipped the, the corporate world and jumped directly to being an entrepreneur? Well, the first thing I would have done differently is I would have figured out something that I was passionate about. Uh, and I found once I had passion for electric bikes, my success rate grew uh, infinitesimally. The idea that you can love what you do, it no longer becomes work. So I really enjoyed my time in the automotive space, but I was working in a chemical environment. I was, I was in the car wash business. I was providing chemicals to car washes and products to car dealerships, services. And it wasn't that exciting. I enjoyed it, but I didn't love it. And so if I had to do over again, I probably would have found something that I love to do sooner than waiting. And it was working in the corporate world was great. Every time I had an attempt at entrepreneurship, it got snapped up. The last company I owned before I owned Pedigo, I started it within a year of being in business. My, my biggest customer acquired me, so I ended up working for, for a, a big company again. And I found that I really am an entrepreneur and that spending time in the entrepreneurial world is far more exciting and rewarding. Risky, but rewarding. 
than working in the corporate world. So my only advice to other people were, if you think you're an entrepreneur, go out and try it, and it's never too young to try. The other piece of advice I have is, is it's, it's, it's never about failures or making mistakes. It's all about learning experiences. So we don't have any failures at Pedigo. We have learning experiences. Things we did right, we continue to do better. Things we did wrong, we, we quickly correct and move on to doing them correctly. So you're a college graduate, and now you've had all this great life experience. And one of the popular thought processes right now is that you know young people should skip college and just start getting that life experience. Would you have done it any differently, or are you glad you went to college? Well, no, I certainly don't regret going to college. College was a fabulous experience. Um, getting a degree, I think, is a, is a measure of accomplishment. I think that's an important attribute today. Today, a four-year degree is a minimum requirement. Like maybe in, in, in our in our grandfather's day, getting a high school diploma was minimum acceptable. Today, I think a four-year degree is minimally acceptable. Um, I probably would have become an entrepreneur sooner, but I did dabble in entrepreneurship in my early days. But I got sucked into the corporate world, and I like traveling and expense accounts and the trappings of the corporate world, um, and only because I didn't know any better. Let's unpack that a little bit. I think there's so many examples of CEOs and leaders who back in middle school were like the candy kingpins. They were they were the guys you'd go to if you wanted candy or, or they were selling something. It really doesn't matter what it is. Do you have any examples of that from your childhood? Oh, yeah. Longer than we could chat about. But yeah, my first experience was I began selling seeds door to door. I saw an ad in the back of a catalog. I was probably eight or nine years old. You can make money by selling seeds. So I bought a box of seeds and I went door to door offering seeds. And I quickly discovered that not everybody wanted to plant a garden or grow watermelons or petunias. And the next uh, magazine that I got was one of these income opportunity magazines that I, I devoured. And I thought uh, the, the light bulb went off literally. And there was a company called Revere Light Bulbs that lets you sell light bulbs. Door to door. <laughs> I thought to myself, well, everybody needs light bulbs. So I would buy these packs in a, for $10, 10, a box of 10 for $10. I think it was four packs of light bulbs, and I would go to door and sell them for $2. And I liked that. I learned about margins. I learned, wow, I like 50%. I like investing a dollar and sending it, selling for $2. I didn't like buying the seeds for 15 cents and selling for 25 cents. Because even if you made a sale, you only made 10 cents. So I learned two very important lessons. Sell higher ticket items and sell t items that people actually need. And I was very successful selling light bulbs. And for several years, that's how I had all my pocket money. I want to talk about Pedigo, but before I do, I came across a interview that you did with Inc.com where you talked about young people should uh, work for somebody else and learn on their dime, learn and get experience before they start their own business. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Sure. Well, in, in my business world, I, I got a job in a, in a sale in, a, in an entrepreneurial-minded uh, company, and I got a sales job. And during that process, I learned quite a bit. And the company paid me to learn it. So I, while I was productive for the uh, organization I worked for, it was also very uh, instrumental in, 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 in teaching me the ways of running a business. And I got involved in all different aspects of it. And I became curious and I understood it. And uh, that was all at somebody else's expense. The risk of becoming an entrepreneur is much greater if you don't have any knowledge. And lack of knowledge can kill you. At the end of the day, the reason, the only reason businesses fail is they run out of money. Well, if you're starting up with a startup and you don't have a whole lot of knowledge, you don't have a lot of money, you better be darn good at what you're doing, especially <laughs> if you don't have any experience because you, you, if you don't have a lot of money, those, those mistakes can become expensive. So my advice is to learn at somebody else's time, be productive, learn, and then when you're ready and understand a specific product or market, then you become an entrepreneur. You know, Don, you've said before that people that start a company in their 50s and 60s have a higher probability of running a successful company, one that's not going to fail. Why do you think that is? Well, I think it's because they've got experience and knowledge and most importantly, wisdom. Um, they understand what to do right and what to do wrong. And I think also they recognize that they don't have as much time on their hands and they don't have the luxury of making too many mistakes. Uh, most of our dealers are in their 60s and 70s. Um, and they are second career people, sometimes third career. Some of them have uh, got displaced by the corporate world and really don't have any other choice but become, become an entrepreneur because they can't find a job. 
And so we offer all the tools to help them be successful. But if you are going to start a business at any age, you need to make sure whatever company that you represent or sell or offer, that they have a support structure to help you. Our company specifically has been geared to make sure that we give all the tools necessary to people who don't necessarily understand all the things that they have to get involved with and give them the resources to be successful. And consequently, we have a close to 0% failure rate. Well, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> uh, I mean, close to zero, that's, that's unheard of. Let's talk a little bit about the growth of Pedego. So you had a dealership where you sold lots of different electric type vehicles, skateboards, go-karts, uh, cars, bikes, but then you decided to pivot and go all in on bikes. Can you think of what that aha moment was for you when you said, okay, I need to stop doing these other things. I need to focus all my attention on this particular opportunity. Well, I'm not so sure there was a moment. It was a process. It was a process when customers, a lot of our customers would tell us how much they love their electric bike. It was a process when my friends and family wanted to buy the bikes. Um, the frustrating part was is that the suppliers that I, were, I was buying my products from were terrible. And I felt that it was necessary to provide an outstanding customer experience. And I was not allowed to do that because my suppliers wouldn't back me. So over the course of the year that I had the store, I learned that skateboards were kids and they were electric skateboards and they were expensive, but most of these kids didn't have six or $800 to buy an electric skateboard. They wanted one and uh, they couldn't buy one. I also learned on the golf cart side and the car side that they were very expensive, very limited market, and more importantly, there was no margin in it. Where the electric bikes were sort of the sweet spot where the customers loved them, they loved the, the ride on, they told their friends about them, they sent their friends in to buy them, and there, were, there was good healthy margins on them. And uh, most importantly, the customers were delighted and they, I saw that that was a huge opportunity for 75 million aging baby boomers and 60 million seniors to get out again and ride a bicycle. An electric bicycle afforded them the ability to do that. Originally, when you tried to bring the Pedego bikes to market, your strategy was to go to the traditional bike dealers and have them carry the bikes. Uh, you were met with a lot of opposition there. They, the traditional bike sellers kind of thought that that was sacrilegious. Can you walk us through that situation? Well, I did back in the early days, and, and we still do today. And fundamentally, the, the, the psych, the hardcore, most of the bike shops uh, are run by cyclists. And cyclists think that, uh, that an electric bike is wrong. And they think it's wrong for wrong reasons, but nonetheless, they think it's wrong. And the, and the reality of the situation was if the bike shops didn't have that attitude, and more importantly, the bicycle companies that make bikes didn't have that attitude, Pedego wouldn't exist. They left a gaping hole in the marketplace for a company like Pedego to come over and be the number one brand of electric bikes. And we outsell the big bike brand names, Trek, Cannondale, Specialized, all put together don't sell as many electric bikes as Pedego does. And the reason is they're not committed to it. And they do it, and it's a product line. It's not something they're very excited about. The people who work in these companies that work in the electric bike uh, division, I say they eat lunch alone. They're sort of persona non grata. <laughs> Why would anybody want to have an electric bike? You know, it defeats the purpose of a bike. We hear it over <laughs> and over again. And I think there's countless examples of it in history and other businesses that have experienced that. Uh, the one that comes to mind right away is, of course, Apple. Nobody wanted to buy Apple products. You had to go to the app. You know, you had to go to the to the to the different store to get the Apple product. And so they opened their own stores. And that's when they became an instant success. The same thing is true with Tesla. You know, Tesla couldn't even consider getting the automobile industry. Nobody would open up a Tesla dealership. So they opened up their own stores. Tesla has become ubiquitous with electric bikes. I mean, electric cars. And, you know, you can think about if you think about uh, an electric car, you think Tesla. If you think about going, you don't say I'm going to go to the coffee shop. You say I'm going to go to Starbucks. So who else, where else can you buy a $4 cup of coffee? Surely you go to Dunkin' Donuts and get a cup of coffee for a dollar or 7-Eleven. But why is Starbucks such a, a raving success? Mainly because they focused on doing something really, really well. And that is deliver a great experience to somebody who wants to get a cup of coffee. Tesla's done the same thing with cars. Apple's done the same thing with computers. There's just countless examples. The best one I love is the Harley-Davidson story. Harley-Davidson has 56% market share. 
and Harley has an interesting model. They have no known competitors. I mean, heck, have you ever heard of BMW or Yamaha or Suzuki or Honda? <laughs> Of course you have. Well, that, those are all their competitors. And all combined, those companies, along with other motorcycle companies combined, don't sell as many motorcycles as Harley does. Does Harley make the best motorcycle? You could argue that they don't. Uh, what does Harley have? Harley has the best experience. They have the best customer uh, loyalty um, because they, they, they focus. The only thing Harley-Davidson does is sell motorcycles. In the bicycle industry, the bicycle industry tries to sell mountain bikes, road bikes, kids' bikes, go down the list, all this full gamut, and they're not really good at any of those things. Some have focused in certain areas, and then they end up finding out that they have to expand it. I mean, there are the, the most successful companies in the bike business are the mountain bike brands like Santa Cruz. They concentrate on selling nothing but mountain bikes. They don't sell road bikes. They sure don't sell electric mountain bikes because that would go against their grain, so they're successful. In the case of Pedigo, we only sell Pedigo electric bikes. We don't sell anything else. We don't sell regular bikes. We don't sell all the different types. We sell nothing but electric bikes. And I think the message here is focus is, is critical, especially in today's world. You better be you better be excellent at what you do. And you, in order to do that, you've got to concentrate on just that one product. What is your, I mean, you look at Pedigo and you think of 20 million in sales. I um, it's one of those instances where it's almost like this 10-year uh, overnight success. Uh, now you guys are one of the, the top-ranked, if not the top-ranked, electric bikes in the space. What's your vision for the future? How do you see this playing out five or 10 years down the road? Well, I think we're just in the first inning of a nine-inning game, and I think we're, we're, we're the uh, top inning, the first inning, and we're going to win. And the reason we're going to win is because we're playing an excellent game now. But the opportunity is huge. I see a blue sky. I mean, in this country, we sold less than two hundred thousand uh, dollar. I'm sorry, we, we, we sold less than two hundred thousand electric bikes to a market that is seventy five million baby boomers and sixty million seniors. So it's a huge opportunity. Uh, so I think that you know, t another ten years down the road, instead of being a twenty million dollar company, I think we'll be a two hundred million dollar company. And that's if we just do okay. Right. If we can do better than we're doing now, we could even be larger than that. So it does take a long time to build a company. I've learned that you need a couple of things. Number one, you need to be passionate about it. Number two, you've got to have sufficient capital resources. And we started this company, we have over over $2 million invested. Most of our co competitors that are started, by the way, we started, we had six competitors. Today, we have 106 competitors. And people would say, oh my God, isn't that terrible? Actually, it's the best thing that happened to us because it's gained much awareness. And the customers do their research online. They go and Google electric bike or electric bicycle, and we're going to come up. And they read our reviews, and they find out we're the biggest. And we are also got the best reputation. So they're going to find us. Even if they don't buy our product, they may buy our product in their second or third generation. A lot of our customers start out buying a crappy bike online for less money, and then they learn that, oh, my God, I should have spent the money, and I should have gotten a pedigo. So... You know, quality is, is a key ingredient, but the most important thing we learned is we can't just satisfy our customers, we have to delight our customers. And as long as we delight our customers, we can become a billion dollar a year co company. Do you think too many companies today kind of lose sight of, of the focus of customer service and delighting their customers? Oh, absolutely. And I, I, I love the idea that my competitors think this business is just, let's just sell bikes. How many bikes can we sell? Pedigo is not in the business of selling bikes. We sell fun. And the good news is we don't have to try very hard, and we don't even have to sell it. Our customers buy it, and there's a big distinction. Our job is to educate the customer, show them the bike, let them try the bike, let them test ride the bike. If they test ride the bike and they try it, they're going to want one. There's like 100% like are going to want one. Then they have to rationalize, should I spend the money to buy one? Is it going to give me enough joy? Is it going to give me enough re uh, uh, utilitarian value? Most of the people who buy electric bikes today in this country, particularly, don't buy them for transportation. They buy them for recreation. They buy them to have some fun, to go riding with their friends, to be able to get up that hill by their house. And one of our real secrets to success is setting up most of our dealers as tour operators or rental operators as well so that people can take a taste. If you go to Costco or any place where they let you sample something, you might taste that wheat bread that they spread some good butter on and say, mm, yum, yum, I think I'll buy that, and go to the, to the case and buy one. 
Well, the same thing is true today. Everyone's looking for an experience. Porsche has an experience center. You can go there, pay $1,500, and go drive a Porsche uh, for a few hours on a test track. And that money is applicable toward the purchase price. That's the same thing we do with all of our stores that we have. And uh, having the customer have that favorable experience of going out on a tour or renting one of our bikes predisposes them to want to buy one. Same thing when you go to an Apple store. You sit there at the counter and you get to play with the different devices they had. Wow, I really need that iPhone 10. Look how cool it is. It recognizes my face. Go down the list. You go to Starbucks, you have a, a, an enjoyable experience. You're going to go back there the next day or the next time you want to meet your friends. You're going to just say, let's meet at Starbucks. So it's interesting, though, there's ubiquitous. There's brands that are ubiquitous with specific products. Um, you know, if you name, if you said, hey, look, I'm going to go get a ride share service, you're not going to say that. You're going to get an Uber. Now, you may not, you may use Lyft, but you're going to say, I think I'll take an Uber. But that's become the brand for ride share. And go down the list, and a lot of companies have that same thing. That's what Pedego is focused on, is saying, I'm not going to go ride my electric bike today. I'm going to go ride my Pedego today. And we've been very successful in, in getting that done. Let's shift gears a little bit, so to speak. And that was a bike joke. So uh, I'm all about the funny puns. But um, let's talk about you personally. What do you consider success in your own life? What is, what is your guiding light? Well, success is me measured by a lot of different factors. But I think success and happiness are synonymous. And, and uh, 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 happiness usually comes with satisfaction whether it's job satisfaction, career jobs, the same thing, career satisfaction, um, your, your personal life satisfaction, you're happy with your, you know, your social interactions with your friends, with your family. Those are all, in my estimation, those are all key ingredients of what that ultimate success is. So an ultimately successful person is good in their social life. They've got friends, they've got balance of, of family, and they've got balance of career. And throw a little bit of fun in there, and um, it's got a high degree of satisfaction. I feel I've achieved that, and Pedego has helped me achieve that, because every day I get to talk about talk to delighted customers. And sometimes I get to talk to not so delighted customers, but I make them delighted. And I think that's a, a, a focus a lot of customers, have, a lot of companies have lost. They're not out to delight their customer. They think all I have to do is satisfy them. Oh, as long as they don't complain, I'm okay. Our, our approach is entirely different. Our approach is they should be delighted. And if something goes wrong with their bike and they need some service on it, they better have a delightful experience to get it fixed. If not, they're not going to be loyal customers and they're not going to recommend this to their friends. Are there one or two habits that you practice every day that you think help make you more successful or more happy? Uh, well, I have several, but I think the most important one is to be instantly responsive. Um, you know, when I wake up in the morning, the first thing is I do is I check emails. And if I find any customer complaints, I'm all over it. If I look on our Facebook page and I find somebody's not happy, uh, I'm all over it. I want to do everything I can. It, it disturbs me to find anybody that's not happy with our experience because if they're not, somebody in the system has fallen down because I've empowered them to do whatever they can to delight the customer at the risk of being taken advantage of, which happens on occasion as well. But I'd rather be taken advantage of than to have one legitimate customer not be delighted with their experience with Pedigo. Not only when they buy the bike, but even five years later when they own the bike, I want to make sure that they're delighted. So um, I think that's probably the most important attribute I have. But at the same time, I spend most of my time talking to customers and, and talking to our dealers and the number one question that I ask all of our dealers whenever I visit them is, what can we do to help you? I never ask them for an order. I never ask them, to, you know, why don't you buy some more of our product? I always ask them, what can I do to help you? And that's been a magical formula for us. Well, I think that takes an approach that's so much different. I think when salespeople have sales breath, so to speak, uh, you can smell it on them and you kind of put your hands up and say, hey, I don't want to buy anything today. But if you genuinely come from a perspective of saying, I just want to help, let me know how I can do that, all of a sudden that kind of leads to the sell anyways, right? Like, okay, well, if you can help me figure out A, B, and C, then I'm going to go ahead and want to buy D because you've helped show me the way, so to speak, on how I can do that successfully. There's no question in my mind that education is the new marketing. If we can educate a customer, they will make the decision. There's way too many resources out there for, for them to explore and discover. 
So our job is to educate them and give them the tools they need to make an educated decision about, A, whether or not I want to buy an electric bike, and B, which brand should I buy? And I think we excel in both of those categories, which I think is probably a key ingredient to our success formula. Growing up through your career, Don, did you have a, a mentor or somebody that y- you looked up to that kind of helped helped you kind of sift through some of the noise as you were going through your life? Absolutely, positively. The most influential person in my life was my uncle Jim. Interesting enough, since you, that's my middle name and that's your name. That's right. <laughs> uh, but yeah, my uncle Jim was a very successful car dealership in New England. He had ten franchises. I always looked up to him since I was a kid. I thought, I want to have the life. He lived in a nice house, had a beautiful wife, a nice family. He had uh, thoroughbred racehorses. He had fast cars, boats. He was one of these, uh, you know, the stereotypical successful entrepreneur. And um, I always looked to him for guidance and advice. And, uh, you know, my Uncle Jim now is 80 years old. I still talk to him and uh, chat with him about different things we're doing. I had lunch with him just a few months ago. Uh, he's retired now and lives on, on Cape Cod, but he was a huge influence in my life and continues to be. Can you think of any moments with your Uncle Jim that were like gut check moments where he said to you, hey, you know, you could be doing this thing differently? Oh, well, there's multiple occasions where that's happened, but I think the the, 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 the most instrumental was when I, when I um, decided that I wanted to start my own business. He said, I'm surprised it took you that long. Right. And uh, he thought I'd be an entrepreneur a lot sooner than I did. So I think his confidence in me was probably the single most important attribute that absolutely you can be successful an entrepreneur and uh, you should take the, 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 the leap and do it. Do you have any kids? I have two girls. They're 32 and 28 and both entrepreneurial spirited. Great. So what has, what has that experience been like for you? I mean, what, what, what kind of wisdom did you try to install in them as they were growing up? Well, first of all, that you had to do everything. Whatever you did, you did it well. And if you did, couldn't do it well, don't do it at all. Uh, the second thing is, is I encourage them to work for companies and learn before they became entrepreneurs, and both of them have done that. Um, my oldest daughter worked at UGG and, and, and understood the powerful of branding and was in their marketing department and named Boots for them and did other, other things. My other daughter got involved in the in the in the, in the uh, high tech business, and has worked for a couple of different SaaS forms, and is working for one now. And both of them excelled in what they do. Let's talk about millennials. Your business isn't necessarily geared towards the millennial, is it? No, we don't. We don't uh, chase that market at all. Our customers are 59 year old male and a 58 year old female, and the youngest of our customers are in their 40s. And the oldest of our customers are in their 80s. We actually have some, a few in the 90s. With that being said, do you employ millennials in your business? And if so, what are those things that you have to do differently with them that maybe you wouldn't have to do with the older generation? Uh, but we have a lot of middle, millennials that work in our company here, and you have to manage them differently. They're, they're a lot more demanding on what they expect from a company. So we provide a great work environment. We provide fun. We had a costume party with rewards. We have a quarterly luncheon where we update them on the progress of the company. We reward them with cash bonuses. Um, We do different things for the millennials that work here. As far as the customers are concerned, we don't really have any. Uh, Most of our dealers start at age 40 and go up, and um, the average dealer we have is in their 60s. So millennials aren't our focus. However, the millennials will become what we call today a baby boomer. They will progress. And we think they're going to be more predisposed to want an electric bike than perhaps our gener- or the baby boomer and senior generation is today because they didn't really have a lot of experience on bicycling. The bicycle industry is failing right now or on the, on the decline because they're not generating new cycle riders. You know, the people grow up today, the kids today and the kids that are in their 20s now, most of them never even rode a bike when they're growing up. And that's a tragedy for the business. The electric bikes are getting people back and realize, hey, I don't have to pedal up the hill. This is fun. I can get some outdoor recreation. I can be social. A bicycle creates all that. The barrier is the fact that there are a lot of work to pedal, unless, of course, you get an electric one. Now, Mike Tyson once said that everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> um, did you ever, true, true quote, did you ever have a moment in life where you had a plan and you got punched in the face 
uh, metaphorically, uh, not physically, and you had to adapt. And if, if you did have a moment like that, can you kind of unpack what you did uh, to kind of end up on that situation on the positive side? Absolutely. So it's happened a couple of times, but the, the most uh, the one that comes to mind first was I worked my way up through the corporate world. I got a job as an entry level sales guy, became the president of the company, worldwide company, two hundred and twenty million dollars in sales. Got the corner office. Everything was there. I was in my late forties. Everything was rosy uh, until one day the company was acquired by a larger company. The larger company didn't have the same entrepreneurial spirit. And we were like, it was a great company, but it was like oil and vinegar. I didn't get along with them, and they didn't get along with me. And But when they took over the company, I signed a two-year agreement to stay there. I realized about a week after I signed that agreement, it was a huge mistake that this company and I weren't getting good along, and I spent two years trying to get fired. Because if I got fired, they had to pay me my stay bonus. If I didn't get fired, if I quit, then I forfeited a lot of money. And that was the money in which I launched to become an entrepreneur. So I stuck it out for about a year, and I wore them out, and they wrote me the check before the time was up, and I became an entrepreneur. But that was really disheartening. When you work your whole way up the corporate ladder, you get to the top, you've got everything, you've got the corner office, but then it's taken away from you, and not from anything that you did, only because there was a change in circumstances. The second time it happened, when I sold my, my first company that I, I, acquired, I, that I bought and built, uh, the owner of the company decided that he was moving all operations to Dallas, and if I wanted a job, I needed to move to Dallas, and I didn't want to move to Dallas. So that was the second time. But I'm thankful for both of those experiences because it led, to me, led me to where I am here today with having Pedigo and having my own company where nobody can do that to me anymore. What uh, if someone came to you, maybe it's one of your daughters, or we can depersonalize it a little bit and say it's just a, a random person that looks up to you, uh, and they're going through a situation where, similar to you, uh, things aren't going as expected. What would be those one or two things that maybe you would say to them in a pep talk to put them back on the right path? Well, the first thing is I always say that every cloud has a silver lining, and when one opportunity closes another one opens um as they say when a door closes usually a window opens and that's been true in my life and you have to just look for that opening so that uh everybody goes through trials and tribulations i don't know anybody who just lives in a, in, on a, a you know lives a perfect life where there's never any trials or tribulations and you're going to have them and the secret to success is to knowing what to deal with them but more importantly i would say that everything in life has a beginning a middle and an end and if you can figure out where you are in that continuum, you can manage to it. And a career is a perfect example. If you have a job at a company and you've been, you know, it's a great beginning and it's a great middle, there might be an end. And if you're coming to the end and you need to be aware of it, you need to plan for it. And I think I've been successful in my life in doing those things, sensing that there's an end. When I worked for that big company, it's acquired by even a bigger company, I knew pretty quick that there was an end. And so I immediately began planning for what that end was going to look like and what I would do next. As far as planning goes, do you do any uh, life planning or goal planning? Has that been a, a consistent? I mean, for someone like you who has uh, risen through the corporate ladder, uh, who has started this very successful company, I understand you've started other successful companies. I would assume that it's important to, to write some things down and to, to kind of track your goals. Are there any tactics that you use in life that help you stay to, true to, to what you're reaching for? Well, one of the biggest influences in my life was when I, when I was in my 20s, a motivational speaker named Jim Rohn. And Jim always taught the, the, the thing is you pretty much are what you think. And if you spend your mind thinking on, on being successful and having a, a, some nice cars and having a nice watch and living in a big house, then you, it, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy and live in that world. Don't complain about the taxes being too high. Don't complain about the economic environment being good. Just think about the positives. And that's what I do in my life every day. I do set uh, goals for the business. We have a planning process. That was my corporate training that we have a, a budgeting process and a planning process and we understand what our goals are. And last year we had a goal to grow the business by 30%. We set a goal last year to grow the business by 30. We put together a whole program called 30 Go to go with Pedigo. And we, we printed coffee mugs for everybody. We had launch meetings. We're all excited. We set bonus plan programs based on 30 Go and growing the business by 30%. Unfortunately, it didn't work. 
we grew by 40 percent so now i've got all these <laughs> so we thought that was a tall goal the challenge of course is what are we going to do next year so we're debating that right now. We're trying to set that top line number to say, what can we grow? We think we can grow at 50% next year. So I think our 30 go programs can become 50 go. I love that. You know, there's so many different, when somebody's telling a story and you're a good storyteller, Don. So I'm just, I'm listening and you're expecting this uh, outcome to be, well, you know, we wanted to hit 30, but we only did 20, but you know, we really, we picked ourselves up from our bootstraps, but no, Don, you came with the, over achievement and so that was that was pretty good i loved that well I, you know if we if we'd only done 20 i wouldn't have considered it a failure i just said we failed to achieve our goal but we didn't fail and getting the 40 is is very rewarding and that's probably it's probably been the most rewarding year i've ever been in business because we've got more competition than we've ever had and we've grown at the fastest rate we've ever had more competition so it's it's competition is good it's not going to go away if you've got a good viable business of course, it's going to attract competitors. But if you look back to the computer industry in the 90s, and it's kind of reassuring to me, it turns out there were over 100 competitors in the computer business. Everybody from Samsung to Toshiba, other lots of no brand names, along with AST and Zeos, and go to the list A to Z, there were over 100 of them. Today, there's only five left. Uh, you know, HP, Dell, uh, Lenovo, which used to be IBM. Uh, Asus, and uh, I probably left one out. Oh, and probably Apple. That would be the one I left out. Um, so, you know, it, it's comforting to me that you can be as, uh, you know, you can be in a very competitive business with 106 competitors, and the computer business was the same way, but only a few end up standing. And I think the same thing's going to happen in the electric bike business. Ten years from now, there will probably only be five or six of us, and I'm 100% I'm confident we'll be one of those. Let me uh, let me ask this question. It's a little bit different, but you seem like a, a naturally curious guy. Is there a topic out there in today's ever evolving world that just kind of uh, that you're naturally curious about? It's something that you're very interested in. It just uh, is kind of mind blowing to you uh, when you put it in perspective from today versus maybe 20 years ago. Absolutely, it's solar energy. We have, we have the, we, you know, if I were going to go into a different business today other than this bike, I'd be in the solar energy business because it's such, so much energy is now able to be captured and the technology is getting so much better. My house is solar powered. I drive an electric car. My electric car is powered by the solar in my, that's built in my house. Um, my next step is to put battery pack in so that at nighttime I'm running off the solar I generated during the day. Right now, the excess energy I generate during the day, I sell back to Southern California Edison, and then I buy it back at night at a cheaper rate. So I have no electricity bill because I'm harnessing the power of the sun. We're getting a quote to put solar panels on our entire roof here and run our whole facility and save three or $4,000 a month in energy costs. And it's, it's, it's renewable. It's, uh, it's unlimited particularly if you live in a Sunbelt area, and we've barely tapped the surface. If I look at all the buildings out in front of me from my office that I can see the roof out, I don't see any solar panels. And I think that's a huge opportunity for generating energy for the future rather than burning fossil fuels. You know, I think a lot of people, after hearing that and knowing the business that you're in, electric bikes, would say that you're kind of like Elon Musk. <laughs> I mean, right? Like, do, do a lot of people make that comparison? Well, I, that would be the highest uh, compliment anybody could pay to me to compare me to Elon Musk, but I, I have nowhere near the, the IQ to him. I have no desire to go to Mars, <laughs> but I am a big fan of his. I've, I'm on my third Tesla. I've met him. I've had dinner with him personally. Um, I have a high degree of respect, and he has, four, he has four pedagos in his garage, I found out recently, and he rented seven more to go to Burning Man with him. So he took 11, and him and his entourage, when he went to Burning Man, he took seven, 11 pedagos with him. So... I'm flattered by that, uh, but I think we're in similar spaces. He's, you know, he's trying to get people to buy electric cars, which make all the sense in the world, and I'm trying to get more people to buy electric bikes. So on a smaller scale, uh, it'd be a great compliment if somebody compared me to Elon Musk. Well, that's cool to hear that he owns four Pedego bikes. So there seems to be uh, a mutual admiration, so to speak. I hope that's true. I certainly have admiration for him. All right, let's move on to a rapid fire question round. So I'm going to ask some questions and just give me your first response. If you could write a postcard 
to anybody, past or present, whether it's an icon that you really look up to or it's somebody in your personal life, who would you write that postcard to and what would it say? Well, I would write a postcard to my dad who passed away uh, a year and a half ago. And I would thank him one more time for uh, instilling me in the values that I have today. Well, let's unpack that. What, what are those top three, four values that your dad instilled in you? Well, the first thing is that do it right or don't do it at all. Uh, that, that's, that's critical to everything. I mean, there, it, there's no point in wasting any time. The other thing was is persistence. Stay persistent. Even if you don't get it right the first time, just keep trying and trying and trying again. And then the other thing is to be physically responsible with money and make sure that you don't spend more money than you, than you, than you uh, take in. And that's true in my personal life, and it's certainly true in the business. You know, we became a profitable company in just two years after we started in 2011 because we are conservative about what we spend. And the only time we spend what I would consider to be extra money is when we've got a good marketing program to go after to get more people aware of our product line. What is your advice to the young entrepreneur when it comes to starting a business and being fiscally responsible? Well, there's no free lunch, and, and I say people should not start a company with borrowed money. Uh, I haven't started any business with borrowed money. It was my money that I saved and, and earned and uh, invested in and bought a business. Now, that's not to say I've never borrowed any money in my business. Once it's up and running, there's capital requirements that you need, and you, then you may have to borrow money on a on a short-term basis. But um, I say that if you're going to start a business, then save your money to do it. Don't try to go to mom and dad to ask them for the money to start a business or your friends and relatives. Save up and start once you get it established. There's three levels in business development. There's concept, there's proof of concept, and there's scaling. In the concept idea, that's when you just have an idea. That's absolutely your own money. When you get to the proof of concept, are people going to buy it? Is this a viable business model? It should still be your own money. It isn't until you get to the scaling stage where you should ask people for money, outside money, to people to invest. And that way you're, you're, the risk is, is minimized because that's the, the easiest part is the scaling part if you've got a proven business model. So my advice is to under, understand the concept, research the concept. I'm a trade show junkie. If I'm walking through a hotel and there's a trade show going, I'm going to find a way to get into it because I always learn something in trade shows. I'm a master at going to them. I probably go to more than I should. But I always learn something when I go there, even about industries I know nothing about. I, I encourage you to, anybody thinking about businesses to master it, to understand it. In my case, I wanted to get in the electric bike business. I opened a retail store first because I wanted to understand the customer. And I think that's a critical thing to understand the buying habits, the motivations of a customer. It turned out to be the single smartest decision I ever made is to have that retail experience because then I can relate to all of our dealers that are out there about their retail experiences. And the people that work here, that I recruit, that work here, that help our dealers be successful, they have retail backgrounds as well. So they can understand and relate and assist our dealers in being successful. Well, I think that's a good takeaway is if you don't have the skill set yourself, uh, check your ego out the door and find some people that are really good at that and invite them to be part of your company. Uh, do you like to read, Don? You know, I, I, I used to read all the time, and then I got um, audible, and I've become lazy, and now I listen to books because it's a lot easier, but I can also do it when I'm driving or when I'm, uh, you know, I'm in an airport. When you, It's not so easy to read, so I am a, uh, a, a, a very uh, addicted audible customer now, and I listen to alternate between business books and fiction books. So what are some of your favorite audiobooks? So my, my, probably my favorite book has been um, the Phil Knight story, um, Shoe Dog, uh, which is how he built the Nike brand. Fabulous book, recommended to anybody who wants to be an entrepreneur. The trials and tribulations that he uh, lists in that book are, are, are things that I've experienced almost, almost every one of them. So that's been great. Um, the Elon Musk story, written by Ashley somebody or other, which is an, the only authorized biography of Elon Musk is a absolute fabulous read as well or listen to as you might have to say today well i love that i mean you sir are someone that adapts with the times <laughs> get the electric bike get the electric car get the solar panels and listen to your books who's got time <laughs> for actually reading these days right the best part about it is none of it's work because it stimulates me uh intellectually 
and that that has its own rewards. As we wrap up this interview, I want to give you an opportunity. Is there just one thing that we haven't covered today that you want to share with our audience? Yes. So first of all, not everybody's an entrepreneur, and not everybody has the, the DNA to be an entrepreneur. Um, if you are one, you probably know it. Uh, you may not have fully explored it. If you're not, it's okay to work in, 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 in different environments. If you, if you think you have an entrepreneurial streak in you, then go to work for an entrepreneurial company. Um, I was very fortunate in the first 20-some-odd years of my career, the company I worked for was very entrepreneurial. And that I, I benefited tremendously from that. So if you think you're an entrepreneur and you're not quite ready to become one, and work in an entrepreneurial environment where you can learn from the who's ever involved in the company about being an entrepreneur. I absolutely love that. And I can say personally that I have been on a Pedego bike. And I think I've seen you in different interviews say this before, and it's so true. You really don't know until you get on it <laughs> and you start riding it. So I would highly recommend. There's over 100 stores nationwide that our listeners go and actually try to find uh, a pedago dealership uh, or a franchise store. I don't know the, the right nomenclature, but, uh, and just test it out because they are a lot of fun. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. The, the, you know, the thing, people don't know what they, what they want. Steve Jobs said it, you know, hanging in my office is think different. And Steve Jobs certainly uh, thought differently. Um, and, you know, when they first came out with the iPad, I thought to myself, there's no way I'm ever going to want an iPad. That's the most ridiculous thing in the world. I have a, a notebook PC. I have a desktop PC and a phone. The last thing is I need another device. You want to know something today? It's my favorite device. I spend more time on it than any of those other three combined because it gives me all the information. All that. And I didn't even know I wanted one until I got one. And once I, I got one, I realized I don't know how I live without it. I think the truth is true with electric bike. Go try one. Don't buy one. Go someplace where you can rent one and try one and invest $50 and take one out for a half a day or a day, and then have that experience, and then decide if it's right for you. I can almost guarantee you you're going to want one after you do that. Don, what's the best way for people to stay connected with you online? Uh, well, I'm on LinkedIn. I like LinkedIn. I'm also on Facebook. Um, we have uh, Pedagos on Facebook. I'm active on that. Um, I'm probably most active on LinkedIn. So if you just look for Don DeCostanza on, on, on LinkedIn, I'm there. Um, and then they certainly can send me an email to don at pedigo.com. Very simple. Wow. You just gave out your email. <laughs> Not a problem. I, I love that. I love that. Well, Don, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. It was awesome to dig into your life story to Pedigo's life story. And there were so many great pieces of wisdom and nuggets for our audience today. So thank you. Well, thank you. And hello fun to anybody who tries a bike. All right. Thanks, Don. Have a good one. All right. Thank you. Hey guys, quick note before you leave. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Leaders. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a review. As we try to grow the show and invite more leaders to share their stories, every subscribe, rating, and review really helps expose the podcast to new ears. And a quick thank you to today's guest and our sound engineer, Jonathan Costco. Until next time, I'm James Fratsky.